Okay, so let's do a linear algebra problem to review finding eigenvalues and introduce finding eigenvectors. Um, we're mainly going to be working with two by two matrices in this class. That's just, I mean, sort of out of necessity when you're doing stuff by hand. You know that once you leave the second degree polynomials and can no longer use the quadratic formula, we don't really have a way to find roots of polynomials by hand. And since we've introduced eigenvalues as roots of polynomials, we're kind of stuck. We need problems that we can work out. So we'll let A be two by two. And let's find its eigenvalues and its eigenvectors. Eigenvalues we did on Tuesday, but want to review. Eigenvectors we haven't looked at yet. So, the fancy way to say this is that we're going to set the determinant of a minus lambda i equal to zero. Um, sorry, a minus that the determinant of a minus lambda i is a polynomial. It's going to be a second degree polynomial because this is a two by two matrix and we'll set it equal to zero. So you can do the work every time, certainly. That is, you can write, well, you have to do a lot of the work. What I'm trying to get at is that you can write every time something like this, that's A minus lambda I, I mean, but after you do a few examples, what you're going to see very quickly is that that minus lambda i puts minus lambdas on the diagonal and leaves the rest of the matrix alone. So negative six minus lambda, five minus lambda. So to find the determinant of a two by two matrix is straightforward. We saw on uh, Tuesday that when you get larger matrices, things kind of go south in a hurry. But for two by two, you multiply the diagonal elements. You multiply the anti-diagonal elements, and you subtract. And this is what we're setting equal to zero. So, FOIL, negative lambda times negative lambda, is positive lambda squared, plus six lambda minus five lambda minus, really? Minus 30 minus 12 equals zero.
And that really come, came from the fact that this was supposed to be um, easy to factor, but it, it is. I, um, or at least, I mean, however easy you find factoring, maybe it does factor would be a better phrase. It's lambda plus seven. Lambda minus six. But going back to something I said on Tuesday, there is no guarantee on tests or homework or anything that we'll be giving you nice uh, matrices where everything factors. You should be prepared to use the quadratic formula. to find eigenvalues. So here we have six and we have negative seven. Now each of those eigenvalues has eigenvectors associated with it. Remember that eigenvalues and eigenvectors are defined together. If you're going to have the, the lambda part of this equation, you also need to have the V part of this equation. So let's start with six. Um, repeating some work we did on Tuesday. So we have, if six is going to be an eigenvalue, there has to be a V such that A times V equals six times V. Um, we can't just pull a V out here because A minus six is not defined, but let me get rid of that parenthesis for the moment. Um, mul multiplying by the identity matrix I is like multiplying by one, so we can stick an I in there. So here is the equation we're trying to solve. And let's remember that V is a vector with components. The next step is going to be easier if we remember that V is a vector with components V1 and V2. So, what we're going to do is we're going to figure out what A minus 6i is, first of all. So, just like when we had A minus lambda i, minus six i is going to put minus sixes on the diagonal and leave everything else put. So negative 12, negative one. Four, three. And now, our black box algorithm. 
which isn't really a black box algorithm. A real black box algorithm is something that probably no one but the person who programmed it quite understands what's going on. But it's black box in the sense that we're not going to explain how it works. We're just going to explain how to interpret the result. And what we're going to do is we're going to copy down this matrix. And then this vector we have here, in fact, let me also write to this. Just like I wrote to V1, V2, let me write to zero, zero. This vector I'm going to copy down and then I'm going to put a dashed line between the last column and the rest of the matrix. And each of these columns of the matrix represents either V1, V2, or a quality. So, I know that I said I didn't want to go into the details, and we won't, but we also want to have some idea of what's going on. A matrix equation is um, equivalent to a system of linear equations. This matrix equation here, is equivalent to this system of linear equations. So notice that this first column, this negative 12 and this positive four, those terms are attached to V1. This second column, the three and the negative one, they're attached to V2. This last column will put an equal sign down there. And this matrix, which is called an augmented matrix, is a storing equations. This first row says that negative 12 V1 plus 3 V2 equals zero. The second row tells us four V1 minus one V2 equals zero. So we're running out of space and there's no need for us to be cramped up like this. Negative 12, three, zero, four, negative one. Zero. And here is a column corresponding to V1. Here is a column corresponding to V2. Here is a column corresponding to equality. Is everyone good with this so far? Then we're going to take this matrix and we're going to feed it into an algorithm on our calculator. And on our calculator, the algorithm is called RREF.
which stands for reduced row echelon form, but you don't need to know that in this class. So we need to figure out how to enter matrices into our calculator. And then we need to figure out how to feed matrices into this algorithm. So you probably can't read it from where you're sitting, but above this button, this X to the negative one button, there's the word matrix in blue. So if we press the blue second button and then the blue negative one button, you get taken to the matrix menu. And what I'm going to do real quick is that I'm going to erase um, everything that's stored into my calculator. So we'll see what you see if you've never done this before, which is just names, math, edit. And down here, you just see this list, A to whatever, A to J. So these are the things we're allowed to call our matrices. Like A is a valid name for a matrix. At the moment, none of these matrices are defined, though. A is a valid name, but we're not using it for anything. So what you have to do is use these arrow keys to click over to edit, and we can decide what name we want to give our matrix. I usually just use the first entry, which is A. And now we're going to enter a matrix into our calculator. And our calculator is asking us, well, first of all, how big is this matrix we're entering? And the matrix we're entering has two rows and three columns. So we tell our calculator, always in that order, rows, then the columns, that there are two rows, enter, three columns, enter. giving my in-class students time to write. So now we can move around this array with these arrow keys and to put a number in the array. For example, to put this negative 12 in, we just type negative 12. Um, sometimes people get an error message because they think, oh, this, this subtraction button will make something negative, but our calculator doesn't like that. We have to use the negative button down here. Press negative 12, enter, and you see it's now in the calculator. Three and zero. Three, enter, zero, enter. Four, negative one, zero. Four, enter. 
negative one, enter, zero, enter. And now our matrix is entered into the cultivator and a, a slightly more advanced uh, UI would have some kind of quit option. Our cultivator doesn't have that, but you can quit out of any interface with this quit command in blue up here. So press the blue second button and then press mode and that gets us out. In fact, it kicks us all of the way to the desktop as it were. So we have to go back into the matrix menu and now you should see the dimension of the matrix. This is our calculator's way of saying there's something stored in A now. Well, you see names, math, edit. Here's names, edit is where we entered A, math is where we find our various math stuff. You see, for example, determinants, matrix, um, our calculator will find determinants for us. Unfortunately, that's not very helpful because the determinants we want always have lambdas in them. And our calculator can't deal with lambdas. It can only find determinants of numerical matrices. And we scroll down with this down arrow key. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, sorry, just some, something to do with the emendation. So we scroll down with our down arrow key until we find R R E F. Again, reduced row echelon form, but you don't need, I mean, that acronym might not mean much to you. We press enter and we get kicked to the desktop again. Back to the matrix menu. Give my, uh, give my in class students a chance to do this, to follow along. Back to the matrix menu. We want to do RREF to A. And now we get an output. And again, as for what the um, calculator is doing under the hood, you've got to take linear algebra to find out, but it's one negative 0.25, zero. Uh, zero, zero, zero. <laughs> the way this works is this first column still represents V1. The second column still represents V2. This last column still represents equality. Then let's see, I appear to have deleted it at some point, but in this matrix over on the left, these rows represent equations. That first row says negative 12 times V1 plus three 
times V2 equals zero. And the second row says four V1 minus one V2 equals zero. Now, over here on the right, these rows still represent equations. One V1 minus 0 0.25 V2 equals zero. And then somewhat uninterestingly, that second row tells us that zero equals zero. Zero V1 plus zero V2 equals zero. And when you're finding eigenvectors, you're always going to have at least one row that looks like this. At least one row where everything is zero and you just don't get any interesting information. So this is expected. So erase that because it's useless to us. It's just telling us that zero equals zero. And now we're trying to find a vector V1, V2, such that one V1 minus 0.25 V2 equals zero. And there are very, you know, formal ways of thinking about this. Again, looking ahead to linear algebra. But what most of us do in practice is we just pick a value and then we solve for the other value. Like if V2 were four, then V1 minus one equals zero, V2 being four would mean that V1 is one. Or if, if V1, if we decided V1 was going to be one, then V2, wait, that's not right. I did something wrong then V2 would, oh, well, of course, we're getting exactly the same thing. I decided to let V2 would be four, and I found that V1 has to be one. Now I'm saying, what happens if V1 is one? And of course, I'm getting the exact same thing, and that V2 is four. But like if, um, if we decided we wanted to let V1 be a two, V2 would have to be eight. So we get an infinite collection of vectors from this. And we just need to select one of them. One slight word of warning, eigenvectors can't all be zero. So the really tempting thing to do, at least I think it's tempting, would be that if you let V1 be zero, V2 would also be zero, and you'd get a really nice vector. Unfortunately, it's not allowed. That can't be an eigenvector. But any other value of V1 will give you an eigenvector. And for our purposes, 
it's not going to matter what the eigenvector is. No, let me reframe that. For our purposes, out of the infinite collection of eigenvectors, one, four, two, eight, one half, two, seven, twenty-eight. There's an infinite collection of eigenvectors. For our purposes, we just need one of them, and it doesn't matter which we select. So I'll put a circle around one of the eigenvectors and call it good. Um, we could repeat this process. Maybe we should repeat this process. It's kind of um, repetitive, but I hope you can find a kind of Zen-like sort of satisfaction in it because we're going to be doing it an awful lot in this class. Um, let's, we've, we started with six and we found an eigenvector. Let's go to negative seven and find an eigenvector. So is this, I mean, I know this is new for some of you. Is, um, does anybody have any questions for me about you know, the work we did to, I guess, even uh, even including the work we did finding the eigenvalues from there. Uh, yeah. So is the eigenvector just a 1 v1 minus 0 0.25 v2? Um, or well, an eigenvector is a vector. So I just... Right, so we're looking for a vector v1, v2. And what we, let me, just trying to erase, not scribble it out. What we found here, is it, I mean, you can't call this an eigenvector because it's not a vector but it's a relationship that V1 and V2 have to satisfy. And any vector that does satisfy this relationship is an eigenvector. Oh, okay. So what I was doing was I was saying, let's, let's find an eigenvector where the first entry is one. So if the first entry is going to be one, then V1 is one, and we get one minus 0.25 V2 equals zero. We solve this, and we find that for V1 to be one, V2 has to be four. Yeah, that makes sense. I was just... So, okay, good. So here's N eigenvector, but there are others because the decision I made that I wanted to that V1 be one was just an arbitrary decision. I could have said that V1 be three. Yeah. And then I would have gotten a different equation and a different V2. Yeah. We could. So for lambda equals negative seven, so what do we need? We need A V equals lambda V. which the same as A minus lambda I, 
ah, see, I also, the reason I always go through this step by step is that even after like almost a decade of this, I tend to make mistakes if I try to hurry. So we want to bring the lambda over. We want to pull a lambda out, but we can only do that if the identity matrix is there. Or rather, I misspoke. We want to pull the V out. And here, lambda is negative seven. So minus a negative is going to be plus seven pi. Our A, where's our A? Negative six, three, four, five. So A minus or plus a number times I. Again, you can write down seven times I and do this very formally. But what it's going to do is add or subtract on the diagonal and leave the other elements alone. So negative six plus seven is positive one. Five plus seven is 12. The other numbers get left alone. Times V1, V2, equals zero, zero. We create a matrix that has this in it. And then we put this zero, zero on the right. And um, when we're finding these eigenvalues, it's always going to be the zero vector on the right. But I'll pause for a second and say that this RREF algorithm would work if instead of zero, we wanted to set this equal to something else. Like, if we wanted to set this equal to the vector one, seven, then we'd put one, seven there. So we're working with these vectors zero, zero, but this algorithm always works. It lets us solve A times a vector equals anything. Uh, notice, by the way, in our calculator, you don't see this sort of dotted vertical line. That's just sort of put there by convention to help people quickly interpret what's going on. We're about to perform the RREF algorithm on this. The stuff to the left of the line represents values. The stuff to the right of the line represents equality. So we'll take our, we'll go to our calculator. I usually just, I mean, you can sort of perform maintenance on your calculator, like 
Now that we're done with this example, we could go to the memory menu and random and um, manually delete this ma matrix that we're done with. I normally just overwrite matrices when I'm done with them. So I'm going to go back to A, the matrix from the previous example, and I'm just going to overwrite it. One, three, zero. Uh, Four twelve zero. Now again, we have to manually quit out with the quit command up here. Matrix math. You can save a button press or two by going up instead of down, but it hardly matters in the long run. We select RREF, back to the matrix menu, select A. Uh, our calculator actually won't care. If you see we've got an open parenthesis, our calculator actually won't care if we don't close it, so I'll just press enter. I said that when we're finding eigenvectors, we always expect to see something like zero, zero, zero. We should always get a row of all zeros. So this is comforting. It means we probably haven't messed anything up so far. Okay, so in this matrix, these columns represent the components of the um, of the vector, except for the last one, which represents a quality. And the zero row we can ignore. But this first row says that one v one, one v one, plus three v two, plus three v two, equals equals zero. Zero. And then an eigenvector is a V1, V2 that satisfies this condition. And it can be anything. Um, I think if possible, and it's not always going to be possible, but once you get to sort of large vectors, you just sort of have to take what you can get. But we generally, I think, try to select V1 and V2 to not have fractions in it. So, I mean, we could let V1 be one. This is a perfectly fine eigenvector. There is nothing wrong with it. But maybe it would be a more conventional to say, well, we've got a three times V2 here. So that's um that's that V2 would be. One So now we have one V one 
plus three equals zero. V1 is negative three. Again, both these eigenvectors are perfectly fine. So are any of the other infinite eigenvectors you could pick. If you decide that what you really, really want is to let V1 be the square root of two, there's nothing stopping you from doing that. The square root of two plus three V2 equals zero. The square root of two is negative three V2. Negative the square root of two over three equals V2. It's just, again, we're going to be using these vectors. So why, why make your life harder than it needs to be? So finding eigenvalues and eigenvectors is instrumental, First of all, in solving systems of linear differential equations. Second of all, in analyzing fixed points of nonlinear differential systems. So it's a huge deal, sort of in, in, in how useful it is. Um, and let's remind ourselves, why is this useful? What uh, what 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 motivated all of this? Well, what motivated all of this was that we were looking at systems of linear differential homogeneous ah, linear homogeneous differential equations with constant coefficient. And we said that we can have solutions that look like a vector times e raised to a number times t as long as a v equals lambda v. So as long as that V and that lambda are an eigenvalue, eigenvector pair. So let's keep this example, but now let's turn it into a differential equation. X1 prime, equals negative 6x1 plus 3x2 x2 prime equals uh, 4x1 plus 5x2. So this is just another way of writing x prime equals negative six, three, four, five times x. And we now have some solutions to this differential equation. We've done the work we need, in fact, to find two solutions. Equal. So let's go to the first thing we did. We started with six, and we wound up with, with one, four. 
So the eigenvector one four times e raised to the eigenvalue six times t. This is a solution. And another solution we found came from the second eigenvalue, negative seven. We found an eigenvector, negative three, one. So, we found some solutions using the eigenvalues we found and the eigenvectors that we found. As a matter of fact, we can make a stronger statement than that. We found all of the solutions. We can create a general solution. So let's call this a theorem. Let's say we have x prime equals a times x, where a is n by n. Then if, I mean, we've already stated this. We've already stated that the superposition principle applies for systems, but if we can find n linearly independent solutions we can create a general solution using the superposition principle. So if we've got solutions x1, x2, up to xn, we can use the superposition principle to combine these and get a single general solution of this form. So, going back to this example, if these, this is a this is two by two. So to create a general solution, we need two linearly independent solutions. Assuming that x1 and x2 are indeed linearly independent, we found all that we need. To solve this differential equation. 
So the question then becomes, are these solutions, in fact, linearly independent? And we don't have to mess around with the Rotskian or anything like that. We have a theorem. So suppose we have an N by N matrix A, and we have two different eigenvalues. Then each of these eigenvalues is going to give us a solution. An eigenvector times E to the eigenvalue times T. Again, this V1 is an eigenvector. So we'll get one solution from lambda one and one solution from lambda two. Again, this V two is an eigenvector. And these solutions we get are going to automatically be linearly independent. No matter what A is, different eigenvalues always give linearly independent solutions. So going back to this, there's no question about it. A has two eigenvalues. Each of those eigenvalues gives us a linearly independent solution. Two is the number of linearly independent solutions we need to create a general solution. So there are some um, complications here. I'm by no means going to uh, be able to finish this section this week. I'll move the homework accordingly. Um, and maybe this, if we have to have spring break right in the middle of the section. Maybe this is the best place in the section. We can stop. And then uh, Tuesday of next, not next week, Tuesday the week after next, we'll see complications of this. And there are two major complications. First, the eigenvalues could be complex. Second, there is no guarantee that an N by N matrix has N eigenvalues. So we have to ask what happens if it doesn't. Both those things to consider later though.